So we will start with the Urban Talk 2 with Yang Berbahagia Tan Sri Dr. Jamila Mahmud, Special Advisor on Public Health to the Prime Minister of Malaysia. The topic for today is Achieving the SDGs Through the COVID-19 Response and Recovery. Therefore, I would like to invite Yang Berbahagia Tan Sri Dr. Jamila Mahmud and Yang Berbahagia Datin Paduka Dr. Dahlia Binti Rosli, the Council of Advisors of Malaysian Institute of Planners, to go upstage and to start moderating and to start the urban talk. Please be invited. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Amelia, Urbanist Malaysia. Uh, good afternoon to all uh, participants here in this location and also those who are viewing you are now uh, muted. virtually. Uh, we have no slides today. Uh, just have a good conversation with uh, Tan Sri. So, uh, good afternoon, Tan Sri Dr. Jamila Mahmud. We are very much honoured to have you here today. Um, Maybe I just say a few words of introduction. Yeah, the conversation this afternoon is on how uh, SDGs could be achieved through COVID-19 response and also recovery, and uh, in the urban setting. And um, as we all know, the pandemic had actually um, changed all aspects of our lives uh, in terms of social health, um, environment, the economy the government, politics, and governance as well. A and all these impacts are cross-cutting across 17 SDGs. Um, but today we are focusing are on, on two SDG, SDG 3, which is health and well-being, and also SDG 11, sustainable cities and communities. And as we know, these two SDGs have a very high correlation with each other. And, um, and also, uh, due to COVID-19, um, funding for sustainable development uh, has, um, has been affected. So how, how do we deal with that? And even perhaps our methods to achieve SDGs and even the pathways might be adjusted. So, and other concerns in the urban setting as well is collaboration and partnership, which we sh shall uh, perhaps just discuss uh, 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 briefly or um, maybe uh, Tansri is an expert on collaboration and partnerships. So that might be, a, um, you might spend some time there discussing. Um, Tansri just told me that yesterday we recorded the one millionth mark uh, of the uh, death mark for the pandemic. And uh, it has been a grim situation indeed. And we are having the second waves and third waves and, and closer to home as well. You know, the post election in Sabah gave us quite a scare you know some in fact we are in fact we are lucky to have Tansri here you didn't follow any minister to Sabah otherwise <laughs> you'll be quarantined so um, so Tansri is in the very scheme of things when it comes to COVID-19 and she shall be sharing her experiences perspective and ideas but first of all I would like to introduce Tansri she told me just a short introduction but I think <laughs> I I uh, I, tr I try to be short because if you see her her accomplishment, uh, it is uh, uh, very inspiring. Uh, Dr. Jamilah Mahmud is currently, as we uh, as we all know, she is the special advisor to the Prime Minister on matters re regarding public health, and uh, she is also a member of uh, Malaysia's Economic Action Council, and is actively engaged in COVID-19 response for the country. And prior to this, Tansri was the Under Secretary General for Partnerships at the International Federation of Red Cross. And her other international positions include being the Chief of the World Humanitarian Summit at the United Nations in New York, and the Chief of the Humanitarian Response Branch at the UN Population Fund. She is an accomplished humanitarian and well known as the founder of Mercy Malaysia and she holds many board positions and NGOs 
and is the recipient of numerous national and international welcome Datuk Sri uh, just introducing Tan Sri uh, uh, I'm concluding soon cut short <laughs> um, well she, she has received uh, a lot of uh, national and international awards and uh, for her contribution to civil society and also her, her work in supporting marginalized communities so um, I think if uh, you Google Tan Sri, you can see all the rest yeah, of her achievements. Can we call Tan Sri Dr. Jamila Mahmoud on the stage, please? Thank you, Tan Sri. Um, as you know, uh, as all of us know, and I had introduced you as someone who is very in the scheme of things of COVID-19 response, uh, perhaps uh, you could um, uh, give some uh, insights and uh, share some perspectives on, on the, uh, because we have been lauded for our good performance in combating COVID in our responses. And uh, from your perspective, um, what else that, what are the gaps perhaps? Are there disconnects in, in the way that we do things? And, and what is the way forward in that? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you very much, uh, Datin Puduka. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Nice to have you here, Dusri. Um, <clears throat> I think the first thing we have to acknowledge is COVID-19, the pandemic itself, is uh, something that is complex and difficult, and we would have seen that it's impacting not just the health sector, but every other sector as well. It's a disruption. Uh, it's created uh, some chaos. Uh, and in with every uh, management of a pandemic, it requires a whole of society response. So I would say that in terms of what have we learned from the COVID response in Malaysia and why is it that you know, even the World Health Organization has acknowledged Malaysia's success, so to speak, in managing the virus uh, pandemic, I think there are several factors. Number one is having um, a very good policy-driven, evidence-based decision-making. I think many people don't realize that at the, at the start of the pandemic, when our cases started to climb, the government agencies and ministerials met every morning for several hours and led by the Director General of Health, the data was presented in absolute detail. And from there, analysis and discussions were held and any decision making was on the base of evidence and fact. And I think this is a very, very important point because one of the most crucial things in COVID management is that it cannot be politicized, it cannot be emotive, and it must always be based on fact. And therefore, some decision making is also requiring a lot of adaptability. We may see you know, patterns uh, that are showing us a certain certain way the virus is behaving and how it is in the community and then it changes and therefore you change the way you know you want to manage and what policies are in, in place and then when you see a, a change in patterns again you adapt so i think that's point number one evidence data driven the second thing is a health system that is strong and malaysia does have a health system that is strong um, and the the added advantage I think we had, and it's not just Malaysia, but Southeast Asia writ large, is that we've been exposed to 
you know, SARS, we've been exposed to other virus, uh, viral epidemics like, you know, MERS-CoV, H1N1, Nipah virus in Malaysia. And so Malaysian health systems have been exposed to previous crises. And if you like, there is a playbook, right, that you can actually refer to and then use the guidance. What have you learned from pre previous crises? So a very robust and a strong health system is key. The third thing is clear communication. I think that the decision to, uh, to get the health uh, director general in front of the television, speaking to millions of Malaysians every day, and sharing the same data that he shares in the ministerial meeting with the public is a very, very important step because the most important thing in managing a pandemic is to ensure that people trust uh, what you're doing and trust the information that you're getting. So I think having you know Director General, who of course has rock star personality, uh, helps, right? And he's charismatic. He gives the data, no nonsense, you know, everything very clearly. Help build the confidence of the rakyat right to actually understand what was going on and and therefore adhere to certain you know standard operating procedures. The World Health Organization has a very clear protocol. There are six criteria, and when you look at your, uh, when you can ease restrictions and so on and so forth. Among this, obviously, will be testing, tracing, isolation, and we were able to then pick up our testing rates from a few thousand to now about 50,000 a day. So the capacity is there. The second thing is looking at you know, whether you protect the vulnerable. And the most vulnerable, obviously, will be the elderly populations, the one with who have comorbidities, right? And then, of course, looking at your borders, how you restrict and then ease. Uh, and then there's other things like uh, communication, community empowerment. And this is what I'm saying about an all of, all of society response. Now, we've put the health systems in place. The policies are in place the testing, the tracing, all the six factors that are, I mentioned I mean, the, in WHO criteria, the rest is up to us. It's actually the individual, the community, the citizens playing their role to stop the transmission of the virus. So the virus requires a host. The host is you and me. If we don't allow the virus to have a host, there's no way the pandemic will spread. I want to give you a little glimpse into some parts of Africa where actually you don't hear that there are millions of people having, uh, you know, COVID-19, partly because the fabric of society there is very much driven by community. And therefore, it's community volunteers going down to say, wash your hands, you know, cover your face, uh, keep your distance. And I think this, these are very important things to remember. There's a very good article, in fact, produced about the racism in, uh, in pandemics and so forth, where people always look at oh, how the West is doing. And if the West is not doing the make well, there's some excuses, whereas they don't look and acknowledge you know, how the East is also doing, or Africa is doing, and they're doing, some parts are doing really, really well. Taiwan, for example, Vietnam, ourselves. You know? and, and I think that you know, this is why pandemic management really requires an all-of-society, evidence-driven approach. I think uh, a lot of, uh, one of the key is, like uh, Tansri said, is uh, communication. Mm -hmm. I think it, uh, you know, data has com been communicated very efficiently and people are confident. But this is at the federal level. I think uh, federal level policies, federal level uh, actions, uh, 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 efficient because uh, they have the experts perhaps at the federal level and yesterday we had a, a, I think there was a discussion saying that it's fine at the federal level but what happens at the local level are they coordinated you know local authorities there might be some gaps there uh, would you like to perhaps give sure. some ideas on <coughs> how um, local collaboration local understanding and even local expertise uh, can, be, uh, can be improved. Yeah, so whatever is done at the federal level is replicated at state level. So for example, uh, Kementerian Kesihatan Malaysia and Putrajaya, there's also Pejabat Kesihatan Negeri, right? And there's also MKN at state level. 
There's also the district officers, uh, district officers' uh, office, which is very important at that era level. So I would say that you know, if you think about information, the information trickles down to those levels, and at Menteri Besar levels as well, they have been brought to Putrajaya to have the dialogues with the prime minister and so on and so forth. Is it perfect? Well, I think that nothing, nothing is perfect in the pandemic. You know, can it be improved? Of course it can be improved. But I think one, one thing that we have to realize is that, and we don't see it on our televisions, is that on a daily basis, the Director General and MKN and others are actually communicating with their state counterparts so that um, you know, they are aware of you know, how they want to enforce policies. And you see this, for example, in Kedah, when we had that you know, cluster, the Siva Ganga cluster, and recently we had another you know, Alostar cluster and Sungai cluster. So you see how, how then would the state do uh, uh, what you call a targeted movement control order if there was no coordination with, uh, with the capital? So normally it's states that say, we want to make sure that this area is secured and protected. Then KKM and others will discuss. We discuss it at our meetings and we'll say, okay, the numbers are high enough. Because you cannot be emotive, right? You cannot panic in that 10 cases and you like Langkabut want to close. No, again, going back to the six WHO criteria, how do you decide when you close and how you open is based on ensuring that your health system will not collapse. Because I want to make this very clear, COVID is not go go going down to zero next month. And I don't think we will even see zero being sustained anywhere in the world. What we need to do is make sure the numbers are low enough so that the health systems can cope. And the only way we can keep the numbers low enough is when we all individually do our part. To all this, when I read about articles, even this uh, conference, we talk about post-COVID, post-COVID, yeah. actually it's not like yet post-COVID. We're still in the... In the, yeah, we're still in that uh, COVID situation. And uh, I think um, maybe um, if we bring to the urban setting, SDG3 Health has uh, in a direct relationship, yeah. even a symbiotic relationship yeah. with SDG11, which is sustainable cities and communities. Yeah. And uh, as you know, cities are the center. They become the epicenters of the pandemic. Yeah. And cities are where you know, congestion is, big population, uh, there are risks when you take public transport, for instance, and um, you talk about homeless, you know, yeah. slums, and so on uh, in, in other countries. So, um, so it has a devastating impact, especially in cities. Mm -hmm. So um, can you give your um, perspectives in the urban setting, um, uh, COVID-19 in the urban setting, Tansri? Yeah, of course, because of the, as you mentioned, you know, we are uh, a very urbanized world, right? By 2050, I think 70% of our populations in the world are going to be in urban settings. But more than that is also urban settings that may be quite disorganized. It's not beautifully planned cities, but, you know, slum dwellings and so on and so forth. And of course, vulnerabilities exist where poverty also exists. So there's a direct correlation between social economic factors and vulnerability to disease as well. So I think that you know, looking forward, I think what we have here, I, I believe very strongly that COVID-19 is, uh, is a terrible thing, but it's an incredible opportunity. It's an incredible opportunity to, uh, for us to say, okay, how do we move forward now? If, if I don't like the word new normal because it's not the new normal. We don't even know what the new normal is. I feel it's the next normal to the next normal to the next normal. We, that, that period of uncertainty is going to be dragging on for a couple of years. And I, and I say a couple of years because I doubt that we will ever return. And we don't want to return to what we were before. It was bad. It was unsustainable. It was pollution. It was you know, capitalism, it was everything else, everyone for himself, right? If anything, maybe COVID-19 has given us a bit of a wake-up call that we're not safe till everyone is safe. We're not safe till, you know, somebody on the street who's poor is also safe because we live in such an interconnected world. So if you look at urbanization, I think it's an incredible opportunity for us to look at how do we become a sustainable city so that because health if you look at health, how is health created? Health is only created 
80% of it is in the health complex, the medical care complex. 80% of health is not created in the health sector. It's from the environment, it's from social factors, and only 5% is from genetics. So if you don't try to change your social and environment determin environmental determinants of health, you will never achieve good health, and you cannot achieve healthy cities because you don't have those social and economic uh, environmental determinants. What do I mean by that? <coughs> it's very interesting if you're, if you're keen to learn more. Um, the Stockholm Resilience Center produced something called planetary health boundaries, <coughs> and I'm really passionate about planetary health. Planetary health boundaries, there are nine things you look at. You look at nitrogen, you look at carbon dioxide, acidification of oceans, all those things, land use. And if you look it up and Google it and look at the University of Leeds um, platform, you'll find that Malaysia's planetary health boundaries have been violated in almost all areas, which means we haven't really protected our planet in our own way. Now, if we look at that model, you have, in, I want to introduce the donut economics, right, the m model, which is really interesting, because the economic model maybe that we need to be looking at is we have our planetary boundaries, and then we have our social boundaries. And if your planetary boundaries and your s are so weak or so disrupted, and your social boundaries, you know, how you take care of your citizens, your social economic status and so forth, is also poor, then the donut, the hole in the middle becomes bigger and more people fall in. If we protect our planetary boundaries and it becomes bigger, and you protect your social boundaries and it becomes bigger as well, the hole becomes small, and less people fall into the hole that makes them vulnerable. I think one of the things that's very interesting is that COVID has really woken a lot of cities up uh, that you know, maybe we need to create donut cities, right? Which means that can we create cities that are sustainable? So Amsterdam, for example, has become a donut city. Brussels, Helsinki. You know, I, I'm in discussion with a couple of people to say, why can't we make Ipoh a donut city? Why can't we make? Can, why, can we not make uh, Malacca a donut city? KL is maybe very complex and big, but can we start experimenting? so that we become a city that's green, that's sustainable, but will also promote good health. Because if you reduce your pollution rates, you reduce your environmental degradation, you manage your water resources, then chances are the determinants of health improve. I want to also say that this pandemic, if anyone says, oh, it's so unprecedented, and oh my goodness, we didn't see it, then they're wrong. We saw it coming. It was not a matter of if, it was a matter of when. We've had all the signals to tell us that it was going to happen, and yet many people were caught unprepared. So this is just the beginning of many things to come. My prediction is we will have more health crises and pandemics, maybe smaller than this, but not after 100 years. We'll probably get it more frequently now because our planet is damaged. So I think you know these are the, the, the wake-up calls I think we have to think about and that incredible opportunity now to try and turn back and reset the button, press the reset button, so that we, you know, in our development moving forward, we have to look at how we take care of the environment, how we take care of the planet, because at the end of the day, it's people, planet, and then prosperity, and partnership is key. Uh, and I think this is where, you know, Private-public partnership is going to be very important. How does government work with the private sector, with civil society, with young people, with women, to bring about some of the more important policies, uh, most important policies that are required for us to then have these sustainable cities and a sustainable health uh, sector as well? Part of my role now is looking at health reform for the country. And you know, my conversations have been about it's not just about health, it's also well-being. Because health alone is not enough. We have to be well. Because we are a country that has the highest you know, incidence of non-communicable diseases. We have diabetes. We have all these uh, you know, terrible diseases that are lifestyle. Yeah. They're not because of genetics yeah, alone. Because uh, if you, well, you, were, you were not in Malaysia when uh, DG Health wa was announcing uh, you know, the number of COVID deaths, you know? Yeah. But, but uh, we in Malaysia, we wait every afternoon. Oh, today, yeah. three deaths, you know? But, and, the, and the description is uh, 
uh, is an old diabetes. elderly, this diabetes, 60 yeah. years old. Yeah. You know, so it's it's actually the health conditions, yeah. uh, and in cities as well. Yeah. So it's the lifestyle. So uh, that that takes us to your discussion just now on healthy cities. Mm. How do planners and uh, local authorities um, uh, implement uh, healthy cities, healthy cities, healthy nation, yeah. healthy planet, like like you you mentioned. So um, I think. Uh, we sh there have been showcases in, in healthy cities in Malaysia, and I think uh, perhaps there sh more work should be should be done to re to have it on the ground rather yeah. than on policy level, yeah. rather than just you know write ups on strategies for yeah. action. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Malaysia we are we are very good at the policy level and identifying you know what are the problems, identifying what are the strategies, what are the actions. But when the implementation is uh, usually much to be desired. Yeah. So I, I think, uh, I do not know, uh, maybe yeah. you, you have seen other countries of how they implement yeah. certain initiatives, Tansri. I think that it begins with proper planning, right? And I think you're, you're spot on in that we are very good at blueprints and all that, but sometimes we don't implement. And how do we hold, you know, this is again good governance, how do you hold governments everyone accountable right to to the plans and the policies that you set in place so i think the first problem is that who is planning and who is in the room M many of times many times the planning process has only the usual suspects in the room and you have to bring the others you can't plan for a healthy urban city without having ministry of finance in there ministry of transport uh, you know, economic development, uh, economic planning unit. You cannot have that without, you know, Ministry of Women's Affairs. Uh, it, all, it has to be a multi-sectoral approach to planning. Otherwise, you start to look at things only from your perspective as an urban planner. Whereas, if you want to do all these developments, you need the budget. Where is it going to come from? It's going to come from Ministry of Finance. Were they involved in the discussions in the first place? So, what I'm saying is that, you know, you have to have you have to really uh, design uh, you know, a process that, and I, I would also encourage a process that is not built on today, but a, pro a process that is built on tomorrow. You know, how many of us spend time to think about what will life be in 2050, and therefore what do I need to do now to make sure that by 2050 my city is actually sustainable? So uh, really having a much more futures foresight perspective, and this is something you know, I like to do, so I talk about it. And the second thing I think is that, you know, what is it that is, what is the narrative, right? Are we looking at development as GDP? Or are we looking at development beyond GDP? Are we looking at it from quality of life? Are we looking at it from sustainability? Are we looking at it from protection of our species, our biodiversity? So all these things, for me, you know, are measures of our development. I mean, when I, when I founded Mercy Malaysia, people asked me why. And I said, because I would like to measure development of my nation and its people, not from the skyscrapers, but from how the people in this country can have empathy and compassion, because that's the highest you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? The highest is actually when, you know, you are actually having empathy for others. So I think, you know, th this, these are fundamental questions we need to ask. They, they sound philosophical, but they're not. Surely COVID has taught us that you can do without that new clothes or the new d gadget because, you know, you're at home anyway, you're gonna wear the same thing. Maybe wear the top, but don't wear the bottom for, for your webinars. And uh, you know you don't really need that much, so I think you know here's here's that opportunity about achieving SDGs, sort of post COVID, um, but in a way that you know questions our own perceptions of what development is. Thank you, Tansri. Um, I think I pick up on 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 your point on uh, good changes in the environment. And uh, I have been at home most of the COVID days, you know? And, and nowadays when I go to restaurants, they are clean. Yeah. yeah, they're clean. Why was not it clean? Why aren't they clean uh, earlier? Mm -hmm. Because there is 
uh, no uh, stick, perhaps. Uh, yeah. So uh, there is this opportunity, you know, and we can see our environment cleaner, yeah. and uh, and uh, of course uh, you would need funding also when yeah. you when you talk about uh, you know uh, cleaning up, sanitation, and the rest. And uh, I would also like to bring up the um, uh, uh, the aspect on funding because COVID-19, we have uh, takes a high economic toll on yeah. all countries in Malaysia as well, yeah. and we have a lot of competing needs yeah. uh, for for funds. How can you uh, uh, do your funding sustainably? Uh, achieving COVID objectives as well as sustainable development objectives? I think the panel before us had a mm. good discussion on financing. And um, so, but I think, okay, okay, look, we need to look at um, funding that is short term, uh, which is meeting the needs of people now, you know, whether it's through moratoriums and all that that's happening now. But we also need that, uh, to look at the long term and we have to also look at innovation, right? So I think one a good example is Malaysia produced the Prihatin Sukuk, uh, which was initially meant to be 500 million, but has been oversubscribed to 666 million or something like that. I think that's really good because it's allowed us to really crowdfund uh, you know, money uh, for social good. Uh, and I think these are the, the, you know, much more focus on social development or rather social uh, social impact uh, bonds, uh, much more, you know, blended finance mechanisms I think would be required. Um, the other thing, of course, is that, you know, when you look at sustainable financing from the health perspective, which is, you know, where I'm involved in, uh, you know, Malaysia has the, one of the cheapest health services in the world, right, in terms of our public health. I mean, it's not sustainable. Our, 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 our people are going to live longer lives and therefore, um, you know, your pension may not be even enough to make sure that you have a long, healthy life after that. And it will just overburden public health system. So I think we've, this is what we're looking at as well. What does health financing look like for the future? Perhaps we need to follow some of the models around the world on some kind of public insurance, uh, policy or how do we bring you know Islamic finance like zakat and all that to cover you know maybe premiums for for um, you know insurance of the bottom b40 b40 and so on and so forth so I think there's a lot of work that we need to do in that area as well you want to ask questions from the public uh, yes okay any any questions from the public uh, regarding uh, uh, today's topic or Maybe you want to talk about, uh, there are planners here as well, uh, talk about uh, sustainable communities and cities in the context of uh, health and well-being, which are, of course, very closely related. Uh, um, can I ask you a question on capacity building? Yep. Um, I've read that one of the SDG on uh, SDG 3 on health, the health target uh, to increase health financing and the recruitment, development, training, and retention of the health workforce in countries, developing countries. Yeah, But um, in Malaysia, there is a notion that there are enough doctors, but actually uh, we, we, are sh we have a shortage of doctors. This is evident during the COVID cases, you know, we have uh, the, the frontliners burnout and so on, yeah? So uh, this is not just especially to Malaysia, I think Britain also, the NHS, they have the problem about capacity building in the health, in the health sector. So um, like for Malaysia, you know, uh, we have uh, about 10,000 contract medical officers and only 3% is permanent as of last July. And I see that uh, our country is giving a lot of money, you know, penjana, billions and billions. Uh, uh, since this is in the, in the SDG, uh, is there anyone who can sort of moot that we should be enriching the capacity of the medical professionals and absorbing them? Because actually we have a, a lack, lack of doctors, yeah? Uh, and uh, what, this is where collaboration is. 
because the prime minister will say that oh you know uh, we laud our frontliners we res you know we honor them but on the other hand maybe the jpa uh, another agency is not in tandem with what the pm is thinking and I think the rest of the population who see the frontliners as as the heroes, perhaps, yeah. As I said, I think COVID nineteen is a huge opportunity. I think that um, as a medical professional myself, uh, you know, some of the, um, the the urgent needs for health. If you look at doctors, uh, you know, I also want to say that we we really don't value our nurses and our other health practitioners well enough. I think doctors are only one small part of our health system, and if I was to single out, which is the the real force and the frontline force, has been our nurses, right? So I think that you know one of the things um, COVID nineteen, of course, has exposed is this very problem that you mentioned, and also in terms of numbers, majority of our health professionals are actually in urban cities, and even though in KL maybe you walk around and so many doctors, so many medical centers, so many hospitals it's not the same as in Sabah and Sarawak, you know? And, and I remember, well, I'm sure it's improved now, but many years ago when I was a practicing, you know, obstetrician and gynecologist in, 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 in government, you know, we hear stories about, you know, people in the interior of East Malaysia not being able to get, you know, to a health center and bleed to death because the river was low and therefore the boats couldn't move, right? To, to be able to get them to a, a health facility that at least had a blood transfusion service or something. And I, I, I'm, I'm talking many, many moons ago when I was a young medical officer, but I'm sure things have improved now. But this is where we, we're talking about the imbalance that maybe there's more medical professionals in big cities because doctors don't want to go to, to some of the very rural areas. And this is why you know, they're contract officers and so on and so forth. So as part of the health reform, uh, agenda that we will be taking forward, we will look into this uh, and we will look into how how do we make sure we have a sustainable health workforce. Because also the other problem is that our, our we have a bifurcation of the health system, public sector, private sector, whereas maybe we should look at how does the public sector also have opportunity in private sector and vice versa. So in the UK, for example, National Health Service, I can be working in the public hospital in the morning, but in the afternoon I can have a session in Harley Street. So, you know, can we look into systems that will allow the best brains, whether it's from private or public, to be able to, you know, serve the nation in, in different ways. So I think these are, it's not going to be easy because we've had such an, an uh, you know, a, a system that has been running for so long but it's certainly one of the things we want to look at as part of the health reform. And you're talking about implementation, so one of the things that I think is um, what we're trying to do at least is that if you're going to have a health blueprint, we want to have legislation behind it so that there will be accountability. It's not just about having a nice blueprint, actually there's, a, there's going to be legal sort of doc, doc, legal processes that will ensure that whatever is in the blueprint and the roadmap is going to be implemented. So I think that's the only way to find you know, uh, a way that we can implement uh, in any of our ideas and our strategies. Thank you. Thank you, Rutan Sri. Um, coming from you, this is very meaningful because you are um, a medical professional yourself. Um, perhaps uh, any questions maybe from the planners? You know, when you talk about uh, lifestyles and what happened during COVID? Yeah. Uh, a lot of people stay at home. Yeah. yeah? S -s Small office, home office. You know, we planners have been talking about Soho's for long a long time, two decades ago, perhaps, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, or more than 10 years. Yeah. But it doesn't seem to work. Yeah. yeah? But when the COVID came in, boleh mm. pula. Uh, people can stay at home and, 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 do, and do their work, and, it, you know, it, uh, it was a positive. A positive uh, thing um, and also um, uh, like um, uh, densities yeah like densities we and public transport I think on public transport we need to sort of reorientate uh, uh, public transport is very important it is the core of the the urban fabric so to say but now uh, you know people uh, feel a bit scared yeah. to, to go on public transport 
So how do we d deal with that? Are there going to be uh, like more cars on the road? You know, so uh, these are the kind of uh, parameters you know that that will change, and maybe planners will have to uh, to take uh, heed. And also, uh, you were talking about just now uh, the donut theory. Mm. Of course, when you talk about economy, economy is not just it doesn't come on a white sheet, yeah? Mm. It comes on the environment, it comes on the social and all the other aspects. I think this also will have to be considered, you know, when you talk about uh, uh, the, the economy the, the of the urban area, yeah? And also in, in planning and to get a balance there. Yeah. Um, There's a question, I think. Yeah. yeah, one uh, from the online participant named Ku AC from MMU. The question is, there is a concern on mental health and also mental well-being during this COVID time. Is there a move of improving the resilience and the coping strength of the citizen? i like to hear from Tan Sri's comment, especially on the overcoming aspect on mental health aspect. That is such an excellent question because it is a real problem. Huh? Um, I will share with you that uh, 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 the Ministry of Finance went down to the ground and talked to 5,000 people uh, you know, uh, who had received prihatin and so forth. And one of the things they found was that they, among the B40 community, community, uh, communities helped each other, whether it's the masjid or the church or the temple, they came to the rescue to you know, people in need. But the big problem generally was mental health. And, uh, and, and you know, one of the first things we need to do is make people understand and destigmatize mental health, right? This is really critical because when you talk about mental health, sometimes the, fo the, the default thinking is, oh, he's got, you know, sakit jiva, like, you know, real, you know, uh, psychosis or something like that. Whether, whereas mental health is about, you know, the mental health pressure, you know, it's actually uh, the kanan, you know, pressure that you feel. And I think that we need to do much, much more because mental health, there are not even enough psychologists, I think, in Malaysia. And, and, and mental health is expensive. If you want to go and talk to a psychologist, uh, you know, it costs you money, right? So, um, so, so I completely agree, and I think that it needs to be given more attention. I will tell you what's happening now. So one of the things I've been working on with a group of uh, really Im important people, Malaysian Red Crescent, private sector foundations, uh, NGOs like you know uh, Mercy Malaysia, you know so many, Suji Foundation and others, is to look at how do we as a as a uh, collective, we built a platform called uh, Match, and if you go to the website, you can see if you look at Kita space match, you will find it. But it's a platform where everyone can put what their resources are. You know, I have capacity in mental health training, whatever it is. So right now, as we speak, uh, they are already planning, you know, in, with this wave of uh, uh, cases, that how are the civil society organizations going to start going to communities and implementing mental health programs. And I think one of the easy, easier things to do is actually to train trainers, right? You can't be a psychologist, but you can actually train people on mental health first aid. There's something called psychological first aid. How do you as an individual recognize someone is under pressure? What can you do? How do you as an individual recognize your own mental pressures and what help can you seek? Um, and I think that in the long term, and again here talking about health reform, is why I, I specifically said it's about health and well-being, because it's, mental health is very important for your well-being. And people are now, everyone is feeling pressure. You and I are feeling pressure. You know, I hate the fact that I can't hug my friend Dahlia. You know, I, I don't like it that I can't shake hands with people because by nature I'm a huggy person. I like hugging people, right? So, so it, you know, it, believe it or not, it causes me stress that I can't do that, you know? And, and, and I can't, you know, go out to places that I would like to go. I can't do the things that I want to do. So, so this is, for my stress is fairly superficial compared to someone's stress who can't put food on the table for their family, right? So my stress is tiny, but, but, but each of us will go through and have our coping mechanisms. And how do we train people on these coping mechanisms? 
because um, you know, and this is where organisations like Befrienders, you know, and I really urge everyone in this room and everyone listening on on Facebook or or whatever, that you know, let's come together as a nation and build more capacity on psychological first aid. You know, I know that Mercy Malaysia is is taking the lead on this. You know, I think we need to have much more online training the trainers programs so that we can train university students, we can train, you know, anyone uh, on psychological first aid. It's not rec rocket science. It's not that difficult to train someone on that. So that the very least we can recognize symptoms that somebody is going through terrible stress. And, and mental health, you know, the range is obviously from here to there, right? What kind of mental health that your problems you're going through. But the very least having someone to listen to you, someone you can turn to, someone you can pick up the phone to, uh, and someone who can actually seek professional help for you is going to be key. Thank you for your perspective. So uh, thank you for that question. Yeah, I think person. that was a good question. Yeah. Because um, it, there is a, a friend of mine, uh, he mentioned about OPLA, all people living alone. Yeah. So this is also one of the, uh, you know, the, the target groups. And I think we will be talking about cohesive family, cohesive yeah. uh, community. If we have those, maybe we don't have much old people living alone. But uh, and uh, when you're talking about OPLA, uh, you will also be talking about the elderly. Yeah, uh, I think they they have a session on on the, on the elderly because these are the very vulnerable when you talk about COVID, and this is very real. Um, even like normal people, Tansri, like I had a friend who had to quarantine in a hotel, and I wanted to give her some canned food. And then the jaga said, no, no canned food. Because people only 14 days can become very depressed in the hotel. You know, what more if you have to be alone for a long span of time? Yeah. So, uh, yes, I think the, the thing on mental health, and I think uh, it is uh, true what you said, there is no stigma. Uh, now, nowadays, the incidence of mental being mentally uh, what, what is the what is the politically correct thing to say to be to have mental health challenges uh, to have mental health challenges it is like uh, maybe one out of I do not know the numbers but yeah. it seems like you know out of 50 people at least there's one yeah. who have these challenges and it's uh, getting uh, the, the quantum is getting larger and larger and uh, I think there's something in society yeah. something uh, in the plannings uh, you know uh, that we could do to, to alleviate this I, I want to touch on that, on the elderly, yeah? Because this is a real problem. I think Malaysians don't realize what's going to hit them. You know, we are an aging population, yeah, and we are going to be, you know, a mini Japan soon, right? We're going to live longer, and we're going to have less children. So the fertility rate is also declining quite rapidly in Malaysia. So in the past, you know, on average, we may have six children. I come from a family of 13. So, you know, and then it became five, then it became four, then it became three, then it became two. I think our fertility rate is projected to be about 1.6, which means that people like you in the room who are younger may not have so many children. Uh, and when you grow old, you know, how are you going to live, live your life? Because you actually, you're going to live longer. You're going to be lived about 80 plus and you have one child say, or no children at all. So I, 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 I haven't raised it yet, but I think one way we are going to be sustainable is actually moving towards digitalization, right? I think mean, we have to look at technology and the digital, um, you know, digital future for Malaysia. So I, I, I said to myself, and I said, okay, I'm going to be 70 in 10 years, and I'm going to be 80 in, in another 20 years if I live that long. And how am I going to live? I have two sons, yeah. boys. Maybe they'll take care of me, maybe not. My daughter-in-law doesn't like me, I'm in trouble. But, you know, perhaps I need to implant an RFID chip under my skin so that my son can look at his iPhone from time to time and know that I'm not dead on the floor. Uh, and, you know, I'm connected to a hospital. So the hospital knows that uh, if I need help, I press a button and they, they know where I am. Or when my medication runs out, the hospital sends me a message to a son, my son, or whoever that I need. Or I will going to post, you know, your medicine to you, and please pay an online uh, payment. So that's the world. That's the future. That that it's not going to be that far away, right? It is underway in, in Malaysia. The 
it's not. It's not. This is me. My, you know, this is my Blade Runner moment. But you know, but it's <laughs> I like sci-fi, right? So, so I think that you know, it, it sounds funny, but I think it's pragmatic, no? I think that you know, if, uh, so so you as planners, as urban planners, imagine if you build a housing estate, and in every housing estate or condominium building, you have one specified area that is going to be a daycare. Not for young kids, because you're going to have lower fertility, but actually older people. So that if I go to work, I mean, my parents are, have passed away, but say if I, you know, God forbid, have to live with my children when I'm older, but, you know, um, they will then not have the burden of worrying about me. So when they go to work, they drop me off at the center. I will meet my friends. Dato Maimuna won't be there because she's younger than me. So, you know, I'll meet some of my friends there, maybe you, Dalia. And then what? We can, we can read together, we can watch a movie together, we can talk so that our minds don't go senile. You know, we can talk to each other, give each other mental health support, complain about our children, you know, whatever. But we don't even, we need to plan cities like this now. We need to plan housing like this. Because it's no longer about taking care of the babies, it's also about looking, taking care of the elderly ones. So that when you come home, you can pick up your parent, right? Or on weekends, you can leave your parents there if you want to go somewhere that you can't take your parents, or you want to go on date night, or whatever it is. But these are the things that we need to, this is why I said, put on a 2050 lens when you do your planning. Start looking at what that future is going to look like. So the systems that you build now are going to be robust enough and adaptable enough, it may be a childcare today, but can it be an elderly care tomorrow? Uh, that, you know, that it's going to be an affordable and part of the mechanism of how your community works. So your, your, if you go to Pusat Perumahan Rakyat, for example, where is the space for, for, for them to gather? Where is the spa safe space you know, for, for elderly people and so forth? It's not been thought through yet, right? But these are things I feel, as urban planners, you need to start looking into. Any questions from the floor? Um, Someone there. Someone there? Yes. Uh. By the way, I heard you can implant RFID chips nowadays. I need to find where. Um, hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much, Tan Sri, for being here and sharing your insights. I'm Shahira. So my question is, um, earlier you mentioned about one of the challenges of implementing a sustainable city is because of lack of proper planning. And you, s you mentioned that all, like, all the crucial bodies should be involved, mm. but um, why isn't it done previously? Like what, what is the problem there? What was the issue? Why couldn't everyone just come together and you know, have like a proper discussion about it? And also, who do you think should take the lead in um, planning all this? Thank you. The caveat is it was a general statement. I've just come back to Malaysia the last six months, so I have no idea how government worked in the past. I know now a little bit. But what I hear from you as well, right? Dalia, you've been involved in this uh, a lot, is that they come together, but there's, I feel there's no visioning, right, on that. What is that sustainable city going to look like? know, all the different elements that I mentioned about the environment, the transport, the this and the other. I think it is done to an extent, yeah, but, but you know, do we look at it beyond the confines of our five-year or 10-year Malaysia plan, right? So it, can we go even further than that? So I think the best I can tell you is how Amsterdam is looking at it, right? Amsterdam, as you know, is an old city, but it decided that, and, I, and what I'm saying now is not too late for cities in Malaysia to do it, right? So, so Amsterdam is an old city, but it's decided that it has to be sustainable. It's no longer, because actually um, uh, Amsterdam is below sea level, right? But it's just that technology and all that, they've been able to, to live quite sustainably. So, so what they've done is they've really embraced that their development as a city is going to be one that really takes into consideration environment, sustainability, social factors, uh, young people, uh, you know, um, your, your, your impact uh, on, on uh, other people's lives, your global contribution to, to, um, 
you know, the SDGs and so forth. So it's not impossible to do it. So the leadership of that is taken by the mayor. This is, I'm talking Amsterdam. So I don't know in Malaysia, maybe Dalia can answer that question because she's been in urban planning for a long time. Maybe just a little bit uh, of background or a broken record, you know. In Malaysia, pl people think planning is, uh, the, the planning department implements. Yeah. Uh, we don't. Yeah. We just do the plans. We do the plans and we do it very scientifically, Tansri. I think uh, we have very good plans. We have a lot of R&D people, expertise in all fields, transport, in uh, housing, economy. So we, on the planning side, we are, I think we are doing quite well, yeah. And of course, uh, who prepare the plans also is not just uh, people in government, the consultants prepare the plans, yeah. So if it's a good consultant, then you have a good plan. But of course, the project managers will, will look at the plans. So that, that's it. And uh, the completed plan will be gazetted by the local authority. And the implementation will be by the local authority. And even though uh, a lot of things, uh, the, the, the plans are supposed to be mandatory, you know, uh, gazetted, there are um, a lot of disconnects sometimes as well later during the, the implementation. So it goes down to the local authority. I think maybe uh, Her Excellency uh, uh, Datuk Sri Maimuna knows about this, you know, on the ground zero kind of implementation what are the gaps, what are the challenges, what are the political realities there. So that is why a lot of beautiful plans cannot be fully implemented. And even like <laughs> in Bandaraya, even in Penang also, you know, there are a lot of issues there. Uh, so um, I think uh, like in other countries, the planning, the planning entity can implement. So. Uh, this was history lah, history in Malaysia. Dulu kita one um, empire building, okay? Planning, we have one department. And then implementation, we have all this. Yeah. So I think uh, when you talk about collaboration, you know, putting all together, yeah. I think there must be some kind of uh, implementation. At least I was telling, have some test beds, you know? You have your guidelines, you have all your uh, policies, you know, uh, get a test bit and do it rather than on, on paper. And I think the local authority is, is not, I'm not saying the word culprit, but they are the focal point on the success or otherwise of the uh, good plans. So, so this is where I'm saying about the disconnect, right? Because if you have planning, doing planning, and somebody else doing implementation, it will fail. Uh, you know, you have to have those people who are implementing you know, held accountable to the plans that are there. And now that you tell me it's gazetted, it's even, <laughs> it's even more important for that to happen. So I think perhaps, you know, these conversations need to carry on, right? I mean, how do you build that? You know, the, the, the way, the, look, our government is built on a British uh, model. You said empire building, right? Different departments, different, it's all those different silos that you create. Now, in modern times, now we are looking at how you break that up and become distributed networks, right? That actually work on almost like project basis. Lah. You want to have this outcome, therefore who has to come together and then hold the accountabilities to that. But I think that's a process. It's a difficult process. It's easy to, to talk about, you know, planning has to be better and all that kind of stuff. The reality on the ground, it's everything. It's finance. It's you know, local politics, local governance, you know, um, the people themselves, you know, what are they consulted on to what, what they want, not just what local government wants, right? So, so I think that, you know, it, it's a process and I think as a nation that is going to be a developed nation, uh, we, again, COVID-19 is this huge opportunity. We've heard from the ground, we know that in the, in the you know, breaking the pandemic chain is basically the weakest link, and the weakest link is actually individuals who will not comply. So similarly, I think you, you know it has to go right down to communities and people and what they actually need and what they need, need to do. Because you can build a perfect sustainable city model, but if the people are not going to follow, they're going to throw litter. They're not, you know, all these things because it's about behavioral change, right? So, so I think you know it, it's more complex than than what it seems. 
there's a lot to do driving the SDG 11, yeah. all the actions, all the targets, you know, because it has to be shared between who plans and who implements. Yeah. Uh, maybe one last question. We've got about five minutes left. The Facebook question. I'm glad people are listening. <laughs> Um, hi, Tan Sri. If uh, evening, uh, my name is Michael from Aerostack. Um, I just want to ask you: um, What do you think of the impact of poor indoor air quality in buildings, um, um, causing the immunity of people to be lower and therefore more susceptible to catching viruses and so forth? So the maintenance mentality of um, a lot of um, buildings in terms of equipment is not very good. So in terms of planning, maybe in future, with, apart from the ventilation, equipment should be more easily accessible to people to easily maintain it. Because now I find that um, some buildings are giving an excuse that it's not very accessible, and therefore they don't maintain it mm. well. And it leads to the sick building syndrome. Thank you. I think you answered your question. Of course, ideally you want to have you know, good quality air everywhere, not just in buildings, also outside. What's the point of having good quality air in the building and you go out and it's completely polluted? Same thing, right? But I think, you know, your point on accessibility, low maintenance, high efficiency and so forth is going to be important. Yeah. Any more questions from the floor or from online? We have okay, one the from last the online. One, yeah? yeah, the last one. What are Tan Sri Daughter's thoughts about the pandemic exacerbating inequalities? such as the before these issues on access to preventative measures such as masks and social distancing in their packed housing areas or public transport. I, I, I didn't get it. Can I, can you repeat? It's a bit muffled. Can you yeah. uh, get another mic or get somebody else to read it, please? Or you want to show me your Facebook? <laughs> Tom. Tom? Tom? Yes. James. Oh, okay, is this one, what are your thoughts about the pandemic exacerbating inequalities such as B40 issues, is it? Yeah. On access to preventive measures such as masks and social distancing in their pack housing. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, uh, b again, in not just in Malaysia, but around the world, uh, we are seeing that COVID-19 has exposed the layers of vulnerabilities, right? And absolutely, if you are living you know, 20 people in one small a, a, a flat, of course the risk of transmission to each other is very high. And similarly, you know, the access to masks and so forth. Uh, what I want to say, you know, it's very easy for us to say this and I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm speaking from ivory tower because I know how it is, right? I've worked in the most vulnerable communities. But I think this is where KKM, you know, came up with the guidance that just take, you know, pieces of fabric, put them together, put them over your face, as long as it's got three layers, you can wash them on a regular basis. You don't need a surgical mask. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, we, we have to do this. I think this is where, uh, you know, government agencies and others have been providing the pro uh, support to B40. And also, um, you know, obviously, NGOs and private sector as well. So we need to come together as a nation. I kept saying this over and over again, that it has to have an all society approach. We're only safe when the other person is safe, when everyone is safe. Uh, and, you know, sadly, one of the, 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 for me, as a humanitarian, the one of the saddest things, of course, is the narrative of them and us, of, of migrants and refugees and Malaysians. Because, you know, we, we forget sometimes that they're here, you know, doing things that we wouldn't do. And refugees are here because they are persecuted in their, in their home countries and they need to flee for their life. But, you know, at the end of the day, I hope that COVID exposes to us, you know, that maybe it's for us to look at how compassionate and how caring we are, right? Because we can't be safe until everyone is safe and everyone is kept safe. Thank you very much, Tan Sri. Um, I think uh, we conclude this session because uh, uh, it's one last question from uh, Puan Wee. Puan Wee was last time with MDEC. Deck? Ah, okay, okay. 
Thanks to you, it's a very insightful sharing that you, you really gave us. And I, I thought I have no questions because many of what questions that I feel I want to ask is already being you know, demonstrated by your good insights. But again, uh, you brought something, I think, implications for planners because today we are talking about urban yeah. forum. Do you think we'll get back to basic with this uh, COVID-19? Responses, very good, yes. We, we have all the system. Every yeah. part of the world know how to respond or they share yeah. their responses yeah, yeah. around the world. Uh, in that recovery process, I think going forward by what you say, next normal, next normal, not new normal. Do you see uh, we as a country will advocate or we leapfrog in terms of our planning, it's not incremental because this COVID-19 has taught us a lot of lessons, like you say about the donut city. Yeah. So it's not new, we can do it, right? We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Then there's also the advocacy now we see around the world about being accessible to all facilities, even the aged, you right? Just talking about it's close by. We plan for retirement community in an affordable way. Not, not just talking about e-commerce and the many things that digital or teleconsultation that we've been talking about. Do you see that we are going back to those basic where neighborhood planning in is very best? So there's already talk about 10 minutes walking distance to get everything that you want, or 15 minutes city that's already being in advocated in a more advanced economy. So may maybe Malaysia, through your advisory role to the Prime Minister himself, you can advocate for us to leapfrog to that rather than incrementally trying to improve on old planning standards, old way of planning cities. So decentralization, because we're seeing a lot of, those days we say agglomeration economy. We want to agglomerate everything and concentrate and then we plan transit oriented thing. So if that is going to be not the way forward, are we going back to basic where we can plan neighborhood, even in the outskirts, in the rural areas where, it, let's say Manhattan itself, people are already buying houses. Houses I in the suburb are getting getting much look into then or everybody trying to cram in the cities. Uh, perhaps you can share your thoughts, Nansri. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that, that's a big ask from you. Uh, I just uh, remind you that I only advise him on public health. <laughs> if I start advising him on planning, then I think uh, he will throw me out of my office. Um, but I think you're, you know, what you're saying is, is very important. I think that it is about going back to basics. It's about, but I think it also starts from us, right? Mm -hmm. Do we voice enough you know, what we want? You know, we need the young people. I mean, uh, you know, I, I cannot overemphasize this. I think that, you know, young people hold the solution to many things and that their voices now are going to be so critical. You know, for the young, they don't, they, you know, I, can, I cannot imagine a young person when he gets older telling his kid or her kid about the year 2020, right? When time stood still and life just came to a halt, right? And therefore, for that person who is young today, surely she or he must have a vision of what future she or he wants. And I think that advocacy is so critical about what you want from your community, from your district, from your country, right? I think it's very powerful. You know, Greta Thunberg is one of many thousand young women and men who have been real stalwarts. She's been hailed the hero, but I trust you, I've met hundreds of Greta Thunbergs in my career. And the influence of her movement has been so powerful that in Sweden, many schools, you know, they don't even serve meat anymore. You know, because it has to begin from us. You want to have a sustainable city, you must have a sustainable life. Now I'm going to ask how many of you here, I'm going to get, I'll treat you to lunch. How, how, if someone can tell me how much water, you can't tell because I've already told you, how much water does it take to produce one Big Mac? Going once, give me a guess, come on. I'll treat you to not, not meat, but come on, throw a number, come on. 
How much water does it take to produce the burger and the Big Mac? How many liters of water? Shout, shout it out. Don't Google. What? 10 liters. Someone, someone else? Go up higher. 20 liters. One more? How much? Okay, give up lah. It's 5,000 liters. The next time you sink your teeth into that Big Mac, think how much you're damaging the environment. I used to like meat. I've stopped eating meat now, right? I've stopped because I, I want to feel that I've contributed to sustainability. I grow my own vegetables. I, uh, my, my, my ambition is to be vegetarian by end of next year because I feel so, so passionately about the environment. I feel so passionately that I don't want, uh, you know, upon my death to be remembered as someone who didn't contribute to the environment. So, so these are personal steps you take. I'm not asking you all to be vegetarian, but maybe you can have a meatless Monday and then change it to a meatless Monday and Wednesday and another meatless Monday, Wednesday, Friday, whatever. But your personal commitment to this, don't talk about what the government can do for you or what policies, it's you, you drive. You know, government is, your, you, at the end of the day, you have a vote, you have a voice. You have to advocate for what is important. So if it's important to you that you have a city that's well planned and it's green and it's healthy, then you have to start voicing, but you also have to demonstrate your commitment to it. So I'm gonna end on that note. Thank you, thank you very much, Tansri. We are so grateful to have you here sharing your very valuable insights and covering almost everything, actually. We started with SDG 3, health and well-being, and also SDG 11, sustainable communities and cities. But yeah, all the SDGs are interrelated, and I think you have uh, covered uh, a very, a very holistic uh, uh, views uh, on the SDGs, especially the two. So um, thank you for your time. We really enjoyed and we really learned a lot from you. And um, also to the participants, Tansri, for, uh, you know, for being attentive and also online. <laughs> so, uh, so with that, I would like to thank you again. And I don't know, maybe the next Malaysian Urban Forum or before that, we would have a chance uh, to, to, to uh, to learn from you, uh, Tansri. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yamabagi Tansri, Dr. Jamila Mahmood, for the insightful and amazing sharing this afternoon. And thank you too to Yamabagi Ratim Paduka, Dr. Dahlia Rosli, the Board of Director of Urbanist Malaysia, for a great moderating today. We look forward for more sessions like this again in the future, inshallah. And um, Yamabagi Tansri and Yamabagi Ratim Paduka, let's take uh, an official photo with, um, with uh, Dato Sri Maimona. And um, I'm inviting town planner Noliza Hashim as well. I'm on stage. Dr. Azmizam and Dr. Rizal is invited as well. <laughs>